recording, recording. All right, so let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Today, I want to share um, my story. Uh, this is gonna. This is a pretty uh, fun one for me because I like to share like how I became Olympian and why uh, I, I actually swam. So let's, let's actually go ahead. Um, so ironically, as a child, I had a huge fear of water. So actually, I was a typical mama's boy where I was very introverted. I was timid. Um, I was the one who was like playing with GI Joes by myself and. And very ironically, I had a very extreme fear of water. So, um, oh, great. Thanks, uh, So, yeah, I have, I have bad memories of older kids dunking my head in the water for long periods of time, um, making me choke. So, when I first started swimming, I actually hated it. I, I you know, actually it was actually a baseball player and I played really well, but I love, also love food. So, I, you know, an, an issue called the BC showed up in my life when I was about 10. And my, my parents got really worried because, um, you know, baseball didn't really help me lose weight. So uh, my, my parents start, they switched my sport into baseball to swimming when I was in Korea, hoping that I would lose some weight. And they forced me into the swim classes, which I hated every day. Um, but, you know, when I started at 10, which is considered a later age for most swimmers, most swimmers start probably like five, six, even earlier. So when I started at 10, I had no expectations of going to the Olympics. It was just more for losing weight. Uh, which very successfully happened, um, from, I think, from age 10 to 13, when I um, got into my puberty years of, uh, from like fifth to seventh grade, I probably lost like 45, 45, 50 pounds. And also my height went from like a five foot normal guy to like almost six feet. So it really helped me. And my mom jokes to this day that like, all my, she thinks my, my fat got squeezed into my height. <laughs> so during that time, you know, after I turned 13, lost all the weight, um, you know, I got, you know, I was trained every day and um, our, my, our family actually moved to Singapore from Korea. And that's when my, my competitive career really started to kick off because um, I, I, you see this picture here to the, the right side. This is a, a ex-national Chinese coach named Zhou Tong Wen. Um, he actually fortunately, unfortunately passed, but um, passed away. But uh, back in the day, he, he just came from China and I, I came from Korea and, you know, um, uh, and this guy spoke no English. And I spoke no Chinese. So, you know, obviously it wasn't the best match, but this, for some reason we had the best communication and the best kind of, I would say, kind of chemistry in regards to um, him helping, really helping me shape uh, into becoming a great swimmer. Um, I, think one, I think one thing that, that I wish that he didn't do was smoking. He did, he did smoke a lot. And back, back in the day when outdoor pools, you're allowed to smoke. He did smoke a lot during practice. I remember him like having like two, three packs of cigarettes while coaching us. So that was back in the day. Definitely not, not doable right now. Definitely can't do that now. But back in the day, you were able to, I guess, you would smoke in the swimming pool. But I remember him um, having this big, like this big, uh, what do you call that? Like kind of like um, a loudspeaker kind of, you know, the microphone. And he always like yelled the numbers. And, you know, I ultimately like, catch the, num the Chinese numbers really quickly. I was able to, you know, understand like if he told me to do like, you know, 50, 100s or, you know, some kind of like a, like a swim set, then I'll understand it. And, you know, it was definitely tough. I would train up to six hours, um, probably six hours a day, um, you know, five, four, four to five every day in the morning, wake up, uh, go to practice, go to school, come back, you know, just rest a little bit, then go back to practice again for two, three hours, and then come back and do homework. So that was my, like, basically my routine from middle school to high school for probably a good four or five years. Um, and I remember like this one practice when I, I had to wake up at 4.30 and it was like this typhoon um, going out in the, in the in the Singapore back in the day. And, you know, obviously, you know, this is what you can see here. This is an outdoor pool. So obviously for safety reasons, you shouldn't be swimming in the, in the water when it's like thundering and like lightning and like having a typhoon, right? But you know, being my Asian parents, my Asian parents, they still drove me to practice at 4:30 that morning when it was just pouring rain. And um, you know, I was I was really mad at the time because I remember, you know, I was like, I'll tell my dad, I was like, father, like, you know, coach is not gonna show up, no swimmers are gonna show up. This is like the worst time to swim. And so we were just waiting in front of the gate of the swimming pool. And you know, funny enough, this coach, coach though, he just walks with his umbrella, he started walking towards the pool. And it was just me and him for that practice. And it was like thundering rain, typhoon. And I remember that, that, that practice to this day that it was one of the hardest practices I ever did was it's, it's, um, it's like a 15, it's like a mile of butterfly. So just swimming butterfly, which is, you know, you guys know like the hardest stroke 
And he told me to do a swimming mile butterfly and uh, within a certain time. And I didn't do, I couldn't meet it. So he made me swimming again. So I basically sent two miles of butterfly that day. I remember that day, like, you know, my goggles were filled with water, but not with water because due to rain, because basically due to tears. Because I was just so angry. And I was like, why am I, what am I doing here in this typhoon weather with this coach one-on-one uh, and swimming just like the most harder set I've ever done in my whole life, my whole swimming career. But, you know, thinking back now, you know, up to this day, that's, that's, I think those are the practices that really help you shape you to the, the athlete, really takes you to the next level really show you that, you know, your hard work does pay off. And I'll, sh I'll share more about like the lessons learned. Um, I just wanted to let you know that, you know, that was, that was my typical day as a typical practice or typical, um, you know, training as I went. And, you know, this was a routine that I was just going back and forth. And um, until my family moved back to Korea when I was a senior in high school. And that's when, um, right at the time I was trained, um, right at the time I, I went to, uh, the Korean Olympic trials. So that was in February. I think we moved in February. And before I went to Singapore, my best time in the foreign individual medley race was six minutes and 30 seconds. So it was very, very, very slow. It's like, you know, probably you, some of you can probably swim faster than that. But now at the, after two, three years of, of training with uh, Coach Joe and I swam at the Olympic trials, I went, I broke two minutes, you know, I broke my personal record by two minutes, went four minutes, 30 seconds, and I broke the national record at that time which was like a huge, a crazy thing because, you know, thinking about 10 years ago, I was this obese kid who didn't have any experience of swimming. And then, you know, after six years later, I broke the national record. So that was a huge accomplishment to sort of take me from that, that age group swimming competition level to actually that international and international swimming competition level. And um, ultimately that meet, uh, you know, broke the 400 meter individual medley. I also won the 200 meter individual, I didn't break the record. And I got second in the 100 and 200 meter butterfly. Um, I, I say here that I was selected to the national team, but not to the Olympic team. So for larger countries like USA, you know, uh, Canada, like, you know, the big countries, um, for each event in swimming, two swimmers can swim for their country for each event. But for smaller countries, you know, they have a time standard, the A time, A time standard and B time standard. So there's like a huge um, international time standard that people need to meet in order to compete. And for, so if, for USA, for example, they're so fast anyway, so two swimmers can represent for each event. But for Korea, like smaller countries, only one swimmer can swim from per event. So, but I was still selected with another swimmer, which I was competing with at the national team. So when, when I even got selected to the national team, there's other guy competing next to me every day during practice. And the coach basically selects uh, the, 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 the faster guy to go. So I was, you know, constantly in that kind of stress mode of you know, whether I'm gonna make it not to the Olympics, uh, even though I was on the national team, uh, I was competing, you know, there's a lot of rivalry and a lot of competition in Korea. So, you know, it wasn't really friendly. It was very like, um, uh, you know, I'm gonna beat you this today practice and, you know, really trying to like mentally break you down at times. So it was a, it was a hard time. And, I, you know, I came from the States most, of, I lived in Miami most of my life. I lived in uh, international most of my life. And it was my first time really going to Korea with no cultural, Kind of experience. And I'm sure, you know, I don't know if some of you are Asian, like, I think some of you are Asian here. So, you know, the Asian culture, and especially in the Korean culture, the age is, um, is a huge, I guess, uh, uh, respect. So, uh, well, even one, one person older than me, I have to like bow to them. I have to like respect them. You know, I have to like, you know, for example, we couldn't, we couldn't eat uh, meals. We, we, we all sit in the table. We had our meals on the table. We had, we had to wait till the oldest person sat on the table and start eating before we can start eating. That was, that was like, for example. And we had to say, like, you know, uh, you know have a good meal, that kind of Korean, but like in a, in a nicer, nicer tone. So those are the things I couldn't really understand. And um, another thing was they did a lot of, uh, what do you call this, like uh, punishment per se, but more of, uh, I, I remember these days where uh, this, this one of my peer colleagues at the same age, uh, I guess one day he didn't, he didn't like bow to the elder, elder swimmer one day. And so the elder swimmer got really mad and he ultimately brought all of us after practice at 8 p.m. And it's probably like winter, very cold. I remember that. He just lined up, lined us up in a, in a straight line and told us to close our eyes. And real, I was like, this is my first time, right? I was like, I, I don't know what's going on. Like I didn't do anything wrong and what's going on. And so I closed my eyes and he told everybody to come forward. I can just hear like these, like this, 
like he's punching the somebody's punching somebody kind of sound from everybody else. It was my turn, and this guy kicked me in the in the chest, like 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 you know like like, like a really karate kick for no reason. And I got so angry at that time. I was like, why am I getting kicked? And it was, it really hurt because it was just like a you know tap. It was like actually like a physical beating kind of hurt. And you know at that time I was so angry at the time. I was like. I came, you know, I trained all my life for this. I went to the national team and I'm, I'm getting beaten up by this random, you know, older guy. So, you know, I had a huge issue at the time in the beginning and it, it was very hard for me to adjust, especially as a high school senior, especially as the youngest guy on the team, um, doing all these chores for the older people. And, uh, but later on, you know, la later on, you really, really realize that it's a different culture. And I think that's also a huge issue um, for swimmers or for, for any athletes. To adapt to um, for it, it, even not, not even not for like international team for all for like a collegiate team right so that was one of the things that I really didn't like about the Korean um, culture but we really understand of the difference between um, you know swimming in the states and swimming in Korea so after that Olympics so let me actually share um, so um, long story short I went to I was able to be able to be selected as the Olympic swimmer for my 200 400 individual medley events and went to Atlanta in 1996 as a 17-year high school kid, my first Olympics. And I tried to pick up some pictures here. I want to share this, uh, this crazy opening ceremony uh, story. Actually, I, I, I want to share too much because I want to share more during the Olympic Village uh, uh, lecture. But you can see here that you know I, my stupid high school thinking of, of going to the Olympics, I need to go to the opening ceremonies. But the problem was that my, my swimming event, my main event was the next day. So of the opening ceremonies at 10 a.m. So um, ultimately, it was a horrible experience going to open. It was a great experience in regards to just being able to walk in, um, you know, Ted Turner Stadium um, in Atlanta, doing that victory mile lap, uh, watching everybody just cheer you on. Um, but after, you know, there's a lot of other things that happened, such as, you know, waiting for the bus to come from the village to this opening ceremonies. Um, you know, Atlanta in August is probably like 120 degrees average. We we're in full suits, so you know the heat was also an issue. Um, you know, big mistake of my part of you know, and actually my coach actually stopped me. He's like, "You shouldn't go to the opening ceremonies because you're swimming the next day." I was like, "You know, when am I going to go? When I'm going to represent again? You know, when when I'm going to experience this?" I had to go, and you know, I remember like leaving the leaving the village at six eight six p.m. and then going to the opening ceremonies. And basically, I want to share this on the right picture here. Like you're, I was one of these athletes just standing around for like two, three hours while other countries were being introduced. So, you know, that's, that's horrible, right? Because as an athlete, you want to save your legs, you want to save, you know, you want to be as rested as possible uh, for the biggest moment of your life. But that didn't happen to me that day, that day, right? I, I, that's when I realized that it was, a, it was a very bad experience for me to actually uh, participate in opening ceremonies, my, my events the next day. And I think I ultimately went home around 2 a.m., and had a swim at next morning, uh, well, the same morning at 10 a.m. So that was a very, you can see, you know, what happened to my race that next, uh, next day. So this was the, the um, I, I think I shared this in my first lecture. Um, so this was, oh, sorry. You can see here that uh, this is my race uh, after the opening ceremonies. I was tired, I was, but I was also really nervous. This is actually the, the, the scariest moment I ever had in my whole life. Um, and you can see on the left side, this is called a ready room, which, which just look, looks just like, this is not the actual one, but this, this looks just like this. It's cold, it's white, it's silent room. Um, they, actually, they actually call it like the operation room because it's so like chilly and kind of has like this very tense, very tense. I, I think that's a great word. Like, like, it's a tense environment where you, you meet your competitors for the first time. And this was my first ready room experience, um, you know, as a 17 year old kid never had any big international swimming experience. I had no clue what was going on. And I just remember my heart was beating so much and my hands were shaky so much. Um, and I think I shared this last time that my, my, I had my swim um, cap upside down and actually had to uh, you know, hit my wall, <laughs> hit my head in the wall. Um, so yeah, I just wanna share that it was just a, a very scary moment, but um, you know, it was also very, very cool to see all the, also like a lot of all the world customers you never saw, you never seen before. You always see on TV, right? So you get to see these guys uh, get prepared. And I think um, I'm sure some of you have seen the Michael Phelps uh, ready room uh, when he was like eyeing down the other guy. 
uh, or just like so focused. So yeah, that's that's the kind of ready room um, experience that you always have. So, um, so after that first experience, it was uh, it was quite it was quite a good experience with regards to getting the Olympic experience. But that really motivated me to, but I had a bad, bad results. So that motivated me to swim even harder, to swim, to swim again at the Olympics. And after that culture issue in Korea, I decided I wanted to train in the States. Um, so I, you know, I begged my parents to, at the time they were in Korea, I begged my parents to, you know, can, can I please apply to you know, college, colleges? And, and actually I was in Korean university in Korea. I was going to a well-known university, but I wanted to go to the States to swim. And I remember I was applying for, um, uh, you know, um, applying for like athletic scholarships in May uh, when, you know, school, school starts in August. So, you know, I applied for all these schools and, you know, thankfully University of Florida, they, they con contacted me back and said that, you know, there's some money available for scholarship. Would you like to come? And this is uh, Coach Balator, Ron Balator, who, was, um, who also passed away, but he was also like a, a very well-known coach at the time, and uh, you know, I uh, and you know, as, as you know, University of Florida, there's all these well-known swimmers like Ryan Lochte, you know, and Caleb Dressel. Like those swimmers are very uh, famous. So I was like, oh yeah, that's great. That's a great time, uh, great for me to go. So I actually went as a Korean to to Gainesville, Florida. Um, I was I can just say I was the only Asian in the team, <laughs> but it was a great experience. And what I learned really there was the collegiate uh, environment. And what was very different from the Korean culture was that. The guys swimming the same events, the rivals swimming the same events in, at Florida, Florida, were like my best friends. Like we we competed against each other, but then off the pool, we were like the best friends. We went to school together. We you know we room room together. We you know went to parties together. You know everything, all the social life. You know everything. We did everything together. So this the university of you know, I think some I don't know if some of you are on athletic teams, but once you're in this athletic team, you're like a, like one big family. And I think that really helped me throughout the four years of, of training at Florida. And, um, and the coach also had a mind, goal in mind of, of not only swimming collegiately, but also um, swimming at the Olympics again. So he had a mind that, uh, you know, and it was just a lot of USA swimmers too, but there are a lot of international Olympians too. So it was a great experience for me just to get exposed to not just like a little bubble of Korean swimmers, but also, you know, all around the world. So um, I put this image here of McDonald's because it's ironically, McDonald's is a huge sponsor at the Olympics. And I'll share more during the Olympic uh, story, but um, my, my freshman year, my, my first year going to Olympics, there was unlimited Big Macs, unlimited chicken nuggets, unlimited Coke, everything, unlimited apple pies you can get. So that's, you can see what happened to my weight after uh, me at the Olympics, my first time. Um, so that four, after the four years, the 2000, um, that was my second Olympics. I, after they did that, I, then my third Olympics was, I was my, I think I was post-college. So I was already graduated from college. I was still, still swimming with the University of Florida. And um, like, the, like they had the, this separate Olympic team where all the international swimmers get to swim together um, along with the collegiate swimmers. So it, it was really great environment to, to just train. And um, at this time, it was my third Olympics. You know, I was, this time around, I was the captain of the team, of the Korean team, so I was more experienced. Um, and I really had a goal. I really had um, more, um, I guess, resources and experience available to sort of help me prep for my last Olympics. And I, I put goal setting here. I think goal setting can be applied to any part of your life, not only for sports, but um, you know, really helping prepare like the long-term goals and short-term goals really helped me uh, to, to gear my, uh, you know, really focus me to, and help me motivate myself every day. Uh, you know, swimming is not a, a, a fun sport, right? It's just swimming back and forth, back and forth. So you need a lot of internal motivation to be, you know, to be, continue to swim. And I think these goal times, um, having setting goal times and practice setting goal times for like preparation meets really helped me to become um, prepared for this last Olympic. So you can see that, you know, the coach, it started one year, so it started like in 2003, 2003. I remember him sitting down with me one-on-one. -on -one and he said, Brian, what do, you, what do you want to achieve? And realistically, you know, my, my, you know I think at, at the time, the gold medal time was like four minutes, 10 seconds. I was about like four minutes, 25 seconds. So, you know, it's not like soccer or like some um, um, sport that has like a random chance of winning. Swimming is more of a, uh, you know, you know, realistically, like where you're going to sit, unless, you know, you, you break like 20 seconds, you know. So I knew that I was not going to get a gold medal. 
I think my goal was to make top 16 at the time. And, uh, you know, uh, he, he asked me for like, I don't know if most of you guys, but it's like the SMART principle, which is the being specific as possible, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time. time work. Correct me if I'm wrong in the chat, but um, he bring me the SMART principle and it helped me really a lot to be as specific as possible in my times. Even to the, like, for example, if it's a 400 meter individual middle race, I would um, get specific as like, you know, breaking it down to like 25 meters. So I'll have like a certain time, 25 meters, I have a certain time at 50 meters, certain time again at 75, certain time at 100. And I, you really train for that. And, you know, it, since individual medley was all four strokes, you also have to have individual you know, stroke times as well. So be as specific as possible, realistic as possible. And there's also several uh, preparation meets as well before the Olympics. So uh, I just remember this story about uh, swimming next to Michael Phelps in one of the prep meets. I think it was in Santa Clara, California. Um, it was like one of the uh, smaller meets, but it's actually a, a huge meet because a lot of Olympians were sort of prepping for it. You know how like World Cup, like in World Cup, there's a lot of friendlies before that. Swimming also has a lot of prep meets before the actual big event. So I remember uh, there's one event when I actually was actually swimming next to Michael Phelps. Uh, he was, I was in lane three, he was in lane four. And um, I remember that he was just like, as soon as he got in the water, he was like 10 meters ahead of me. And by the time I was done, he was probably like 20 meters ahead of me. But, you know, I, ultimately I, he finished first, and I, like 10 seconds later, I finished second. <laughs> so it was, a, it was a large gap, but I, I was able to finish second. I think that's when he reached over to me and he said like, good job, Brian. And I was like, good job, Michael. So <laughs> that, that's really like my Michael Phelps moment of being able to like shake his hand and just say good job to him while he also said good job to me. And I, I was surprised that he actually knew my name. That's my story. And so at, in 2004, um, that's when, uh, in my last Olympics, and my, that's my Korean name um, here. And uh, this was a, one of the great Olympics because it was, it, was, it was great that I trained enough and it's great that I didn't have any regrets in regards to my time and also my place as well. And I just wanna share here, here. this is uh, like a heat sheet. So um, you can see here that um, I'm in the heat three of the prelims of this Trinidad Region Medley, you can see here. You can see Michael Phelps is like the last heat. So, and swimming wise, lane four is the fastest lane, and then lane one and eight are like the like the, the, the lowest lead seeds of the lane. So you can see here that you know there's although we're, I was in the same Olympics, I was in the same race because there's also all these other swimmers trying to compete. And basically from these heats, you get um, top eight. So top eight get to go to the finals. So you swim in the morning, and uh, uh, and actually for 200 meter and below, there's semi finals, but like for 400 meter medley in the morning and top eight get to go to like the A finals. And back in the day, there's actually B finals where the top 16th, it's like nine to 16 get to compete in the B finals. So that was actually my goal, just to compete in the top 16, like in the B finals. You can see here, um, I just wanna share my races, the results. So in 1996, I was 26th in the 200 and in individual medley and 21st in the 400 individual medley. Um, 2000, didn't have great experience, so I was 33rd in the Ford division. I only swam in one event at that time. And then in 2004, uh, I got 20. So that was my highest place was 20th in the Ford division medley with the new national record and um, 26th in the 200. So those things, I, you know, it didn't really, it, it's not like gold medal wise, or it's not like, you know, top 16, I didn't really reach that goal. But I was happy enough to, you know, uh, just think that, you know, I did break the national record and I did a place, the best place finish I ever done in my Olympic career. So I was pretty happy with that overall at the time. Um, no regrets really, but it really, you know, if I look back now, I wish I could have done more because, you know, if you think about it, it was only a few seconds away. If I, let me go back here uh, to the heat sheet. Uh, you know, five seconds, I was two, 205 in the Trinidad meter and he's probably 10 seconds, oh, okay. 10 seconds, is pretty, it's a pretty large gap. But like to like five, six seconds, if I, I think if I trained more, I probably um, would have made like top eight. Basically. So that's uh, my story. Okay. So um, the remaining, remaining time, the 10 minutes or so, I'd like to just share, um, you know, what I learned. Uh, so I, I try to compare, I try to list like three things I've learned from competitive swimming. And the first thing is uh, no fear, no regret. So when if, I don't know if you know this logo here. This is like a back in my day kind of no fear logo. Um, I don't mean like this kind of fear regards to like 
really getting scared where you're going to a haunted house or seeing scary things. Um, but I mean like a different kind of fear. So like I said, in my early years about my huge fear of water, um, over time, I just had to overcome it. Uh, it, it I think at the time, it's simply because of my parents. I was scared of my parents. <laughs> and, uh, you know, assuming it did help me lose a lot of weight. Um, you know, in fact, you know, about like 45 pounds or so. And, you know, just training for the Olympics and re representing Korea, going to my first Olympics. And after my first Olympic race, you know, I had a pretty bad race. I think I was finished, finished like 32nd or 30, whatever, 30th, 30th position and being way slower than I expected. And I remember like after that race, during this, going to the locker room and just, just, you know, just crying in the corner because I was just so devastated and regretting it so much. Um, but that was also, I think that was also a turning point for me in regards to my mentality um, of, of not having that kind of fear again when I was at my first race of just being so shaky and so nervous at that time, right? And um, just to tackle upon it. Like if you have to do it, just tackle upon it. And, uh, you know, as you know, I failed many times in swimming. I failed many, many times. I, you know, there's many races where I, you know, I didn't, I didn't do as well. Um, and, you know, didn't, didn't reach my goal time, for example. But, you know, just get back, back, back up. And I think that kind of negative motivation actually helped me to train harder the next time. So I'd be more focused uh, the next time I race. So my message to you is to like, you know, if, if you have any failures or, um, you know, just try to get back up and tackle it again. Um, if, if, there's any, like, if there's like a task or job that's really difficult in your life right now, you know, don't be scared, like don't try to avoid it. Uh, you, know, you can be scared of fear, but don't avoid it and try to tackle it. And if it's to the point where you can't tackle it anymore, you know, you can just walk away and, uh, you know, and come back again later and keep on doing that until you do it until you don't have any regrets, right? Um, or maybe find another career if it doesn't really work out. <laughs> I'm just kidding about that. So the next thing I want to talk about is that hard work does pay off in regards to swimming wise. Like uh, applied to swimming, uh, let me actually share this number here. So um, as a data geek, I want to figure out the number of laps I competed in the Olympics and came out with this kind of uh, numbers. So I practiced about 8,000 meters average of, average of practice, uh, two times a day for 365 days, minus the 53 Sundays. And because um, we do have to rest up, adds up to about 100,000 laps a year. And you multiply that four, so that adds up to about 400,000 laps um, to compete in like in a less than five minute race. So you can see how much dedication it takes just to swim in that less than five minutes. And even it's even shorter for most swimmers, right? Or similar, you know, 50 meters only like, like 20 seconds or less, 20, 25 seconds or less. And you're training all this time for. That little time and you know is it really worth it you know if i do it would i be able to do it again i i would definitely do it again if i had the ch if i had the chance i would do it, i would probably do it harder i'll probably push harder myself time and you know just looking at this number it might seem a little crazy and this is probably why when you meet a swimmer or like a former swimmer they might be a little off and a little crazy <laughs> because you know swimming does make you a little bit crazy just swimming back and forth you know that four hundred thousand times just thinking about think about it. So you, you try to think about you swimming 400,000 laps, 400,000 laps just back and forth, you know. I remember like I was talking to a badminton Olympian and he used to make fun of us because, you know, all we did was swim back and forth, back and forth and all these endless laps. And, and you know, this picture is, these pictures show exactly what like morning winter practices are like, like in 30 degree outdoor pool weather, um, being able to swim at 5 a.m. when everybody's sleeping at that time. Um, and I'm just thankful, very not like looking back, I'm very thankful to my parents and my coaches and you know my, my colleagues because they're the ones who took me to practice, they're the ones who motivated me to practice at 5 a.m. And I was telling you that before that, you know, there are many times when my goggles are filled with water with like just tears because I was practicing so hard. And I remember like there was times when after practice I couldn't lift, even lift up my utensils for, for a meal because I you was know, just so tired. And um, but I think. So assuming those endless laps of six to eight hour practices really helped shape my character and really helped me to become strong and work hard. Uh, you know, I did, really didn't have the talent of, of like other swimmers, like, like Michael Phelps has like natural talent, right? I didn't have that kind of natural talent. I had to work my butt off to get to that level. 
And I think those those things really help you. Um, and, and, and at, at the end of the day, you know, those endless laps, those gold, lead to gold medals, uh, national records, um, you know, I traveling to countries that I'd never been before all around the world. And most importantly, I think it, it really helped me to become Olympian. So, oops. so yeah, I, um, yeah, so I would do it in a heartbeat again, but um, not in present time, of course, because uh, <laughs> not now, but, you know, you know and I, I admit, I, although I was uh, probably the only swimmer to never have a six pack, <laughs> I still remember those crazy practices. And it not, it, from now, it really helps me to work harder to be to my fullest um, ability. And, you know, because, you know, no pain, no gain, right? And anything is possible if you're committed and, and to work at the fullest, with, um, again, with no regret, if you're able to work um, to, a, to your fullest ability. And you'll definitely succeed in life and whatever you do. Um, whether it's, you know, athletics or whether it's work, if you just give it all and, and have really have no regrets and really work hard. And the last thing I just want to share, I know we're kind of early, um, we have some time. Um, I know this pointer doesn't really match with the first two, but I thought this was a very important pointer because, um, especially for those who are like introverted and timid like me, um, I think one of the most thankful things as being in Olympia is that it's a it's a great conversation starter when I talk to people. Um, you know, many, many people now that I meet are very, very surprised <laughs> when they find out that I, I sent to the Olympics. They're like, oh, you know, a lot of sarcastic, like, really? You, uh, like, you, did, you, did you go there for, as a fan? Or, and then when I, send, when I tell them I competed, I'm like, really? Like, you know, um, you have to double ask, like, so it even took my, even took some convincing my wife, my current wife to, um, uh, I was Olympian, like when I first met her during my heavy days, she, you know, she, she was really surprised that I actually saw the Olympics. So, but ultimately, you know, this is a great conversation. And I just want to tell you, know, that if you're introverted and timid like me, or like really scared of starting a conversation, I learned it's a very important trait to be the one who can start a conversation and to just to be confident in yourself. Um, and, and just to be the person who can you can talk to with as a just as, just as human as you are right the other person you're talking with or you're with the group of people are have you know are just as human as you are so you know if you don't have to say anything you can smile talk about I think the best thing to talk about is like the weather or current news or if it's something that you know like who you know but you're sort of awkward with you, know, you can compliment them on something you know that they're wearing for example or you know I think now nowadays kind of more um, sensitive, but like, you know, try to be a good conversation starter. Like try to be the one that are, are you know, the person that can help first um, start the conversation. It's so hard to start it, but I'm sure a lot of people are having the same thoughts as you are. I remember one story that, uh, you know, at work that, um, you know, there's one person that I was kind of awkward with. And, you know, one day I, I, I um, it, 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 one, one great thing is that as a person, everyone wants to hear compliments. So, you know, I think, uh, but just don't go too out of line like I did um, when I complimented a coworker how pretty their fingernails were. <laughs> and let's just say, you know, things really got awkward afterwards. So um, yeah, try to be uh, as not awkward as possible, but also be a good um, person to just initiate a conversation. And I, you know, I love sharing my Olympic stories, like how, you know, like walking Olympic, um, like walking the Olympic opening ceremonies was one of the most memorable moments in my life. I'll never forget, um, especially that energy the crowd gave while walking the victory lap, um, and you know, really experiencing how inside and how what the village looks like inside. Um, it's uh, to be honest, I'll share more, but to be honest, it's really bare. Not not much to do. Um, as you can see here, like some pictures here, like that the picture on the left side, are just two single you know, twin size beds that athletes sleep on, um, and you know, on the bottom left is where we actually stay, where um, most of the facility like the apartments of where we stay, the lodging are just being developed. So that, you know, they have the purpose of developing it and the after Olympics of using it for just um, everybody for the public use, right? Um, and, it, you know, those experience of just like those 24 seven dining halls where you can eat anything for free, including like, you know, unlimited chicken nuggets and Coke from vending machines. And, you know, just being starstruck by meeting like world-class world -class athletes. Like, you know, you can see here like Yao Ming, I circled here. This guy, but so people next to him are like six, 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 seven. You can see how like tall Yao Ming was at the time. 
and you know, I had, I have like experiences playing with like um, laser tag and like video games with other countries. Um, so there's a lot of other perks that you can do, but um, like I have so many other stories that I'll share during uh, the future lecture about the village.